If you guys enjoy what I do, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. It really helps the channel and it's free and easy to do. Welcome to my channel where we cover the lore of Final Fantasy XIV. We cover the stories both big and small, the epic and the cute, the silly and the tragic. I hope you all enjoy the ride and welcome to the Chronicler of Lore. In Old Charlian, the Warrior of Light runs into one of the technicians who had worked on the ship Ragnarok, and since you've made it back from Ultima Thule, they've been going through the ship's flight logs. Your journey left them a lot of records about places and events that they had never dreamed of, but one of the transmissions they had pulled from the logs had been intercepted while you were in flight. They think it's an audio message, but none of their people have been able to decipher the language. They had almost given up, but they think they figured out the way to crack it, and it's only fair that you be there to hear it. As it turns out, the reason the Charlians have a chance of decrypting the message is because they called on the Ironworks for help. Biggs is the first one to show up, and he's surprised, but not really, to see that you're once again in the middle of something interesting. The message is alien, probably from a very far away star, and aside from the moon bunnies, the Charlians don't have many space allies to ask for help. So they called on the Ironworks, and the first thing Wedge thought was that it would be a good idea to see if Omega could figure out the message. Not the big Omega that tried to kill you all, but the little model that they made. It was supposed to just be a simple device that would follow a target, but Biggs had seen it acting odd on more than one occasion, and after hearing the reports that came back about the Omicron and how they could store their minds as data outside of their bodies, Biggs started to think that Omega may have put his mind into their model right before you finished it off. So teaming up with the Charlians, Biggs and Wedge added a voice box to the toy. When Wedge and Alpha show up with the Omega minion, the Warrior of Light asks him if he's in fact the same Omega that you fought. Turns out that it is one and the same, but Omega admits that he's no longer a threat in this new form. According to his calculations, he's about as strong as a baby, and the machinery that let him switch bodies died with his older body, so he's stuck where he is. If the model breaks, then Omega will die. Permanently. In short, Omega is no longer a threat. Before he'd switched bodies, he'd re-examined his directive and decided that even though his form had changed, the mission of evolving hadn't. So he still wants to figure out what makes you and others like you so strong. And since Omega recognized the language in the message as pan-galactic basic, he uses a different tactic to get what he wants. One that's almost as effective as brute force. Blackmail. Since Sid apparently uses the floor as a storage space for notes, Omega read a report on the final days, and he learned that his planet of Alphatron was destroyed after Medion got there. After reading the report, he also got a decent understanding of Dynamis. What he doesn't understand is why the Omicrons weren't immune to it since they shouldn't have been driven by emotion, yet their leader still had the desire to end it all after dealing with Medion. So Omega wants to study all the factors of the final days to get a better understanding of the heart and the intangible and oftentimes illogical emotions that come with it. And for that, having the help of an illogical being like the Warrior of Light would be perfect. And it's not like you have a choice if you want Omega to decipher the message. Alpha will probably tag along, but the little chocobo fell asleep during Omega's long and boring conversation. Instead of just going over Sid's notes with the robot, Wedge thinks it'll be a more enjoyable experience to go and do the research on the final days in the field. That way you can find Omega's answers and keep Alpha awake. Maybe. Omega is okay with that, and there are three specific things that he wants to study. The first is how the final days cut through Razad Han. He couldn't really find any pattern in the people who transformed. It all seemed random, so he wants to visit the place. It's a long way from Old Charlian, but fortunately, since Omega and Alpha are both practically toys, Omega points out that if you just put them in your pocket, you can teleport with them to the Etherite Crystals, which will make the trip a lot faster. It works, so you, Alpha, and Omega head around the city talking to people to try and figure out how they avoided transforming into blasphemies. After talking to the people in the city, Omega tries to come up with answers on how they avoided transforming, but all of the people's reasons are so different that they do nothing to tell him where the source of their strength came from. He decides to try to talk to someone who lived a similar life to someone who did turn, but managed to avoid it. He decides on a merchant similar to Kazal, so you take him to talk to a man named Jinabaha. 
the only thing that Jinabaha thinks that may have helped him survive was the fact that he was more focused on protecting the workshop than being afraid. But then again, fear over not being able to fulfill his duty to his people may have been what caused Kazal to transform. Which again, doesn't help Omega much, but Jinabaha knows a guy named Nashvan who might benefit from talking to you. So your very odd group heads out to find him. The man's extremely excited to see you or any member of the science who had helped him and a lot of other people escape on the day when people had started to turn. He lost his son that day and he likely would have turned himself had it not been for the signs. Even afterwards, he had lost the will to do anything, but Jinabaha kept giving him random jobs to do until he was able to pull himself together again. Omega can't understand how giving someone who's lost the will to do stuff, stuff to do, actually helps since every instinct in the man's body was telling him to just lie down and die. It doesn't help all that much when Nashvan tells him that the thing that made him want to give up is now the thing that makes him want to keep going. The concept is so hard to grasp that Omega starts to wonder if he just doesn't have the ability to understand human emotions. The fact that humans don't even understand why we do some of the things we do should have clued him in. Because you can put multiple people in the same situations, give them the same upbringing and resources, and they all still might make completely different decisions. Omega decides that it'll be for the best to just accept the fact that people are random and move on to the next part of his study. And that takes place in Garlemald. He wants to study the Ilzabar contingent and the people of Garlemald because he can't understand why the two groups didn't immediately start working together despite having a mutual enemy in the Talaferoi. While that is something that a logic-based machine wouldn't be able to understand, Omega should have thought about how the cold would affect his new form. For the moment, he hasn't frozen to death, so he wants to get started with talking to people. For the most part, the locals have started to get a bit more friendly with the outsiders now that Julius and his Imperial soldiers have started to help out. There's still people who think it's a trick and the foreigners are using their odd magic to enslave people's minds. Granted, Anima was used to do that, but it wasn't done by the outsiders. Still, it's progress, although Omega points out that talking to the Garleans isn't the best way to take over their nation. That's also not the goal, which has the Omicron wondering why the outsiders are even in Garlemald. The fact that some of the Garleans are willing to starve to death rather than accept help from people they don't like is stupid to Omega, because it is. And the fact that the Ilzabar contingent is trying to help the Garleans despite them not wanting it is also stupid to Omega, because it is. The people are all irrational, and Omega thinks that all Omicrons would have come to the same conclusion, which still doesn't tell him anything about how mortals' hearts and minds work. He's only learned that mortals are good at complicating simple stuff. It's a terrible trait, one that you saw lead two sisters to run away from you and die when you and the others first reached Garlemald. Omega saw similar self-destructive behavior when his people were conquering planets, so he thinks seeing the graves might help him understand the why behind those actions. You're not the first ones to arrive at the graves. A soldier from the First Legion named Aeneas is there. He's one of Julius's men who you met before and a prime target for Omega's questioning. What the man thinks is a weird Magitech communicator wants to know why he's there and he doesn't really have a reason. Alphano and Alice told him the story of what happened to the sisters so he came to visit their graves to pay his respects. The twins still feel bad about the deaths but the Garleans don't blame them especially not since they were tricked into starting a civil war and killing a lot of their own people anyway. It's kind of hard to judge other people's mistakes when you're busy trying to take accountability for your own. Omega doesn't see the two things as similar at all and from a logical standpoint, he's right. If you steal a car and your neighbor steals your TV, the fact that you're a thief too doesn't change the fact that your neighbor still owes you a new television. But from a moral standpoint, you're both pieces of crap. Omega doesn't think morals have anything to do with why the Garleans aren't attacking the Ilzabar contingent. It's either because they don't have an army large enough to win if they do try to fight, or their emotions are interfering with their logic. He wants Maneas to tell him which one it is. It's true that the Garleans are militarily outmatched, but that's not why they aren't fighting. Surviving is more important than holding a grudge. In other words, revenge is important, but not as important as food. But the people are of two minds about everything, even the way Lord Quintus decided to opt out instead of being captured. Some think he abandoned them to the enemy while others think that he freed them so they could make their own choices. What they believe doesn't really matter because in the end they still have to move forward. So it's better to save your energy for what's important. And if that means working with the contingent, he's fine with that. Plus he likes the twins, which is natural. The twins are hard not to like, at least once you get past the Realm Reborn. Alpha no sucked in a Realm Reborn. Omega actually understands Maneas a bit and he's starting to realize that he may have been working the heart problem from the wrong angle. 
It wasn't the mortals who controlled their thoughts and emotions for power. Their emotions are so out of control that they basically use your body as a puppet and drive you around. That's also why studying mortals hasn't done anything but confuse him. So for his third field of study, he wants to examine something more in tune with the ancients than mortals. And for that, he wants to see the Loperets, also known as the Moon Bunnies. So it's time for a trip to the moon. A study of the ancient machines on the moon base could help him get a feel for the ancients and their civilization, but he doesn't have the tools to get into the computers with this new body, so he needs a bit of help. Growing Way just so happens to see the three of you, and he runs up to say hi, but when he sees Alpha and all of the Chocobo's fluffiness, he gets depressed by the fact that the Loperets have officially been outfluffed. But when he hears that you want to study their inventions, that means you haven't replaced them with a much fluffier creature. So he's more than happy to take Omega around to see whatever he wants while you wait. Alpha and Omega come back without the bunny, because after Omega's 50th question, the moon bunny had stopped paying attention. Omega had seen enough to figure out the rest on his own, so he let the Lopper go. From what he learned, he labels the ancients as a level 4 civilization, which means two very important things. The first is that there's a system for ranking different civilizations in the universe, and the second is the fact that Omega casually labeled the ancients as a level 4 civilization means their ranking isn't all that special, and there are other planets out there with creatures of the same power and intellect as unsundered Asians. Regardless, their status didn't rid them of their flaws that caused them to be self-destructive, but studying them should tell Omega more about why his own leader went the same route as so many other worlds. Which means, he wants to talk to the Watcher, but instead of teleporting, he wants to ride Argus. Banas' dog refuses to let them ride it, and Omega assumes that it has something to do with Growing Way's fluffy level. Because the Moon Rabbit is an idiot, the genius robot Omega thinks that there's a fluff-based hierarchy where the fluffiest creature rules. Argus clearly thinks you're all stupid, but he gives you a ride to the Watcher who is happy to have so many visitors. But it turns out that the person best suited to answer Omega's questions about the Ancients is you, since you spent so much time with them on Elpis. It turns out that the person who the Watcher was modeled after was a scholar at the Anider during the time that you went to the past, and he was a close friend of Ana. He remembers joining her group during the final days, but he can't remember much about the event, which was likely something that Ana did on purpose so he couldn't influence the newly created people of the Sundered World. But he still remembers how sad he felt when Vana became Heidelin's heart, because she'd never be able to live among the people she cared about again. But her friend wouldn't abandon her even then, and she must have hurt him, which is why she restored him in some way as the Watcher, similar to how Emmett Selk recreated Hythodeus. And all of her plans were successful because of you. After hearing the story of your time on Elpis, Omega can't understand how you look at Vana as a hero. What she did led to the end of the final days, but she did severe damage to the world and its people in the process. And she left Emmett Selk and the other Unsundered, her friends or at least her associates, in a miserable state for thousands of years. Even Hermes needs to be mentioned, because if he hadn't tested mankind, they never would have become strong enough to do what was necessary. He's similar to the Omicrons who first started turning their bodies into machines to grow stronger. The first attempts were bad, but they led to the successful ones later on. And even though Emmett Selk tried to destroy your world to restore his, he was working towards saving his people, which makes Omega wonder, was he the hero or the villain? The true answer is they were all heroes and villains depending on where you stood, and that gray area is what has been hard for Omega to understand, but he's starting to get it, slowly. No two people are the same. There's no way to determine what choices people will make, even if they're put in the same situation, so no amount of studying will allow anyone to accurately map human emotions. But it's not the same for the Omicrons. They all follow the same logic pathways, and should all come to the same conclusions no matter the situation. At least that's what it's supposed to be. Yet Omega still doesn't know what led their leader to the final decision that destroyed their world. So he's going to continue putting all the data together and try to figure it out from there. But for now, this little trip is over, so it's back to Labyrinthos you all go. You all make it back at the perfect time, as usual. Something's come up and Biggs and Wedge have to go help Jesse with a job that got messed up. Their airship's already arrived, so they want to talk to Omega on the way. Since you helped him out with his investigation, Omega's come to a conclusion. He labels your heart and emotions as a phenomenon, one that influences the individual's perception of reality, which is actually a very good definition. Since you helped out, He's willing to translate the message, but even more important than that, he's come to the conclusion that the Omicron's leader didn't make a logical decision after meeting Medion. He acted off of his feelings and decided that it was for the best if all Omicrons stopped functioning, which means whether they become machines or not, deep down the Omicron can feel things too. 
As for the message, it's nothing special. It simply says in so many words to keep pushing forward and hopefully all of your days are happy ones. Simple or not, it makes you all smile. The fact that he still can't understand why something so small had such a massive effect on your emotional state, Omega is determined to continue his search until he figures that out and why his leader decided that the Omicrons would have been better off dead, meaning that his journey with Alpha is far from over. This concludes the story of Omega Beyond the Rift. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, subscribe, join the discord, ding that notification bell, and if you really want to show your support, you can donate to the channel through the link in the description. Until next time guys, later.